Hello everyone, thanks for joining us today. My name is Bridget Quigg, I'm the Communications Manager at Socrata, and we are happy to have you today for this GovStat Hangout with Beth Blauer. We have an amazing panel of performance stat experts with us, and um, the title of the Hangout today is Three Lessons in Data-Driven Government Success. You'll hear a lot of stories of their experiences, and they're going to come to you with advice about leadership and choosing data sets. Uh, and other important work. So with that, I'm going to just make sure you know that you can tweet us at GovSat uh, on Twitter, and you can also write us your comments on YouTube or on our live streaming page for this Hangout. Beth, take it away. We're having a Okay, am I there? All right. Well, thanks everyone for um, joining us for our second installment and also bearing with some of the technical issues that we're having this, uh, this morning, this afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to thank you and um, invite you to continue to join us. This is the second um, in our series of GovStat Hangouts that we're going to be doing. Again, um, this is a free-flowing conversation. Um, I am so excited today about our panel because it are, they are people that um, I work with frequently um, and that I have been working and observing and learning from um, throughout my career as a performance stat professional. So I am incredibly, incredibly excited to be with them today. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to introduce them. We are still experiencing some technical difficulties. So Daniel Hadley, the director of Somerset in the city of Somerville, <clears throat> will hopefully be joining us. Um, I'm joined by Chad Kenny, the director of CityStat in my home city of Baltimore. Oliver Wise, the director of Office of Performance and Accountability in the city of New Orleans. Matt Power, who is the director of StateStat in the state of Maryland. And Emily Love, who's the director for Focus on Results in the city of Atlanta. So I just want to thank everyone for joining us today, and I'm just looking forward to having the discussion. Um, again, for those of you that are joining us um, to observe the, the, the Hangout, um, I encourage you to ask questions. So again, you can tweet us at GovStat, at Socrata, or um, at um, uh, just uh, sending all the information in through um, Twitter. Um, or if you uh, don't want to ask questions now but have questions later, you'll be able to um, access all of our information, including a recap of the, of the Hangout uh, on our website. So thanks, everyone. And uh, why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, the first thing I wanted to do with everyone on the phone was just to talk a little bit about the history of your GovStat programs. GovStat, um, or your, I'm sorry, your performance stat programs. So performance stat is sort of a methodology that's employed um, sort of in different variations in all of your governments. Um, and I'd like to start, Chad, Kenny, with you as sort of um, the, the anchor in our group, um, coming from Baltimore City, probably one of the oldest um, one of the oldest programs, if not the oldest programs, for a state for a complete government-wide um, performance stat program. So, Chad, why don't you give us just a little bit of a description about the program um, and a little bit about your history? Sure. Um, so, again, my name is Chad Kenny. Thanks for having me on, Beth. Um, we started 13 years ago in 2000. I believe our 13th birthday is coming up in a couple of weeks. Uh, uh, ben Mayor Martin O'Malley. Uh, we'll had a consultant in for um, improving uh, CompStat and crime reduction, and they realized that uh, this is an idea that they could apply to all the agencies. Uh, so they started CityStat in June 2000. Uh, we started with really basic personnel data collected in Microsoft Word documents, and it's evolved significantly since then. Um, we have, I believe, 12 different meetings on a four-week rotation. Uh, the, measures we collect uh, across the board, um, and we've gone from very agency-based meetings to more of a hybrid where we still have many, many meetings that are agency-based and then a couple that are uh, focused on citywide issues. I think that's it. Beth, what did I miss? No, I mean, I think just to get us started, that was perfect, and I'd love okay. to now turn it over um, to Oliver Wise, who is joining us from the city of New Orleans. And um, I think that he has a great story to tell. So Oliver, why don't you tell us a little bit about the program that you run in New Orleans and some of the great work that you're doing.
Oliver, I think you're still muted a little bit. Let's see. All right. Here we go. There you are. Yeah, thanks. All right. Uh, so, uh, Mayor Landrieu uh, came to office in May 2010. He was my boss. That's when I joined the administration as well. And uh, when the Landrieu administration came to office, there was really no performance management practices at all. No, there was no emphasis on using data to be more accountable to, citizen, to citizens to help drive decisions. And um, I mean, management within City Hall was really just woeful. And so uh, when our CAO, uh, Andy Coblin, was uh, had his first press conference, he said, I'm going to use a Baltimore-style city stat program to run City Hall. And um, that, that approach to management got its first legs in terms of monitoring the implementation of Mayor Landrieu's blight strategy. So within 100 days or so, Mayor Landrieu announced a big goal for reducing blight in New Orleans. And blight uh, that's, you know, abandoned delinquent homes is, is a huge problem here, among the worst in the country. And announced a strategy for dealing with that problem, a goal of reducing blight by 10,000. And part of the strategy was to create a blight stat program. So every couple weeks now, it's every month, we meet with all the important uh, players in city government who are involved in, in uh, contending with our blight problem. Uh, and we review a series of performance measures to see how we're doing. And we review what's working, what's not, what we need to do to improve. And that program was very well received. Those meetings were public. And we got a, a, a lot of citizen involvement in that program. And then uh, with that momentum, that program was launched in November 2010. Uh, we got together some funding in the 2011 budget, which starts January 1st, to create our office. Uh, we have, it's myself and a team of four analysts, and we have a series of other stat programs for high-priority cross-departmental initiatives, and then a quarterly report card, which we call Results NOLA, which uh, reports out on the performance measures for all departments. Great. Thank you so much, Oliver. All right, Emily, why don't you tell us a little bit about the program that um, you oversee um, in the city of Atlanta and a little bit about the work that you're doing? Sure. Uh, so Atlanta is a little bit unique compared to some of the other cities. Uh, we were actually a very early adopter for the performance stat program. Um, and we actually initiated our initial program back in 2007. Uh, the program got off to a great start. Uh, it was largely driven by the leadership um, over that program, however. And when that leadership stepped aside, about three years later, the program went through a series of, of ups and downs is, is probably the best way to put it. Um, and what we ended up doing is about a year ago, so this time last year, um, before I joined the team, the program what, had gotten to the point where while we were measuring um, data and collecting information on the city's performance in a number of different areas, we'd gotten to the point where we weren't actually able to use that data to drive results. So we were in a situation that I like to call metric proliferation. Uh, if I look back at the database uh, for where we were last year, there were over a thousand metrics that we were tracking for various city departments. And I can pretty much guarantee that if you asked any commissioner to name the top ten metrics that they cared about, they wouldn't have been able to answer that question. So we had tons and tons of data, but it wasn't helping us make decisions and it wasn't actually driving results. Um, so what we decided to do, and I, I use the term we loosely, our COO, who had actually been the, the woman who initiated our, our stat program, decided to put the program on hold. And so we took about six months to really take a step back and think about how we wanted to relaunch the program. We did a lot of research, um, actually speaking to a number of the folks who are on this call and to other cities. We brought in the consultant team. And what we, what we ended up doing is relaunching the program in January of this year. Uh, we have completely rebranded as the For Atlanta team, which stands for Focus on Results Atlanta. Uh, and our focus is, is both um, going back to that sort of core performance management component and really using core metrics. Uh, we're looking at no more than 10 to 15 metrics for each department uh, and really focusing on those metrics that are uh, visible to the public. So they're metrics that people care about. They're metrics that we can actually manage and, and use to drive performance. Um, and they're metrics that we can capture. So uh, one of the things that we challenges we've had before is we tried to get aspirational and 
when you couldn't capture the, the key metric you wanted, you captured 15 other things that sort of got to the point. So we're focusing on what we can, can measure, what is visible to the public, and what it will actually drive results. Um, and then we've also expanded the fo focus of the team uh, and we actually have a, another half to the team which is focused on actually driving improvement within the department. Um, and we have a couple of folks from the private sector who have worked in consulting who are actually going in when we identify performance issues and partnering with those departments to actually implement the changes and to, to make sure that the operations um, components of it get off the ground. Uh, so we do a lot of the actual performance management work behind the scenes. We are still evaluating our stat uh, session model but what we typically do is meet with departments on a monthly basis. When we collect the data, we identify the areas where they're performing well, what's driving that, and what are the lessons we can learn, what are the areas where we're not doing so well, and we need to uh, really drill down and understand what's driving those performance issues and, and focus on uh, moving the needle. Um, and then if there's a significant issue that we want to highlight or an issue that crosses departments, we have a, a session where we bring everybody together, our COO chairs that panel, um, and we actually have a collaborative discussion around how do we move the needle. Um, so we are in our first, this is the fourth month where we've collected data. The model seems to be working. We've seen some, some strong success, but we, we still have a, a long way to go in terms of really fully stabilizing. Well, that, that's a great description of the program and also a good segue into a, a question that I, I want to ask later about how do we evolve the performance stat model to um, both as technology evolves, but also as leadership changes and, and as we move through transition, I think it's a really important um, a really important question that I promise to get back to later in the Hangout. But before we do, Matt Power, do we have audio? Can we hear you? Matt, are you there? Nope. Still no audio? All right, well, Matt, hang tight. Matt can also communicate to us through uh, the chat. So if there are questions for Matt when we, get to, um, when, we, when we get into some more questions, I want you to still be there so you can communicate using the chat functionality. If you can just re-mute your microphone, though, because it is providing a bunch of feedback. Fortunately, I know a little bit about the program in Maryland. Um, Matt uh, took over uh, after there was a huge gaping hole left in the program in Maryland. No. Um, <clears throat> Matt is, has, has ably taken over the, the job as the state stat director in Maryland, job that I formerly held, um, and has <clears throat> done a great job really um, changing also the, the process and, and the approach based on his own leadership stuff. So really looking forward to seeing how it goes. But state stat in Maryland is a traditional performance stat model that was borrowed and taken directly from city stat in Baltimore when the governor was mayor, he implemented it in the city, and then <clears throat> um, when he was there in the city, really adopted it very widely from the NYPD's implementation of CompStat in New York City and used a lot of the same philosophy of um, distributing resources based on need, using GIS as sort of a centerpiece for solving problems. Uh, the map was sort of the cornerstone of the deployment at CitySat in the early years, and that sort of grew along with the work that we did um, at the state level. And a really, you know, at its core, was taking data from across the enterprise of government and aligning it to solving really hard problems. And that's really what we did at StateStat. Um, uh, we did that both in the implementation of the, perf the performance management piece, which was done both for programs and operations at the, at the state level. But then we also rolled all of that work up into what we called the delivery unit. We had some high level, a high level framework that was shaped by um, 15 strategic goals that the governor articulated where we took the data we were looking at on a daily basis for overseeing about 85% of the state's budget, a comparable amount of the workforce, we rolled that up into um, aligning with, um, with the agencies through these subject matter steps that coincided with those 15 strategic goals. Um, but all of you have great web presence also, so you can go on to your websites and see them for more information. We'll also distribute links and um, information about how to access some of the information about your particular programs after this. Um, and Daniel, we're still having, I think, difficulty getting hold, a hold of Daniel. So what we'll have to do is um, we'll have to reschedule a one-on-one -on -one hangout with Daniel Hadley from Somerset, because Somerset is a city that is doing some incredibly innovative work, particularly around STAT. Um, they're one of the originals, um, the mayor um, the mayor in, in the city. Um, oh, oh, Matt has 
Matt's gone. Yep. So the mayor of the city of Somerville um, has been incredibly innovative and real leader in using data to drive performance and outcomes in the city of Somerville. And so I think if we have the opportunity, we'll certainly bring Daniel back in. Um, so I'd like to go back and, 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 and focus on a couple of questions. The first question I wanted to pose, and I think I'd like to start, um, I think I'd like to start with Emily on, on this question. Um, and that is, you know, I think that one of the most critical aspects for our um, use of performance and data-driven government and GovStat um, in the state of Maryland was leadership. Um, Governor O'Malley was an incredible advocate for this work, um, obviously did this work um, when he was mayor of the city, and I, I know that I wouldn't have been able to you know, hit the mark on so many of the things that I was doing in Maryland without his leadership. And I think leadership is incredibly important. But there kind of begs the question, which is, do you need to have an invested leader in order to be able to do this work? Or can you do this work and have it start off um, organically, either from an administrative perspective, a program perspective? You know, it's almost like the chicken and the egg question, the leader and the performance-driven data-driven government question. So, Emily, I'd love to hear your feedback and, and kind of your thoughts around that question. I, I could talk for a very long time about this, but I'll try to shorten my answer. Um, my thought is that I think it, it really does take the, the leadership who is going to not just make the, um, sort of make sure that data is a focus, but really how we and take that data, how we interpret that data, and how we use that data to manage our operations. I think that is absolutely critical. Um, so the leader who started our stat program, uh, I think it's, it's a great example because she's been in the city for the entire um, duration of, of for when we've had a stat program in place, but she's been in different roles. And so when she was leading that program and the COO and the mayor were very um, adamant about having data, using data to manage their, their operations, the program did great things and it you know, really was sort of the... Um, one of the, the core drivers of, of where the city focused its resources, where it focused its priorities, and how it managed departments. Um, she then stepped away from the program into more of an operational role. Leadership changed. It wasn't as much of a priority, and the program, um, and when I say leadership, I mean both the administration as well as a lot of the commissioners or the, the leaders of the department. Uh, we got new, new folks in. They knew they had to collect the data, but it sort of got pushed to an admin level, and people just, they stopped using it. They stopped um, sort of letting data drive or help to drive some of their decisions. And then when she re-engaged and, and really set the tone from the top that the, the data is critical um, and that she expects you know, commissioners to, to manage their operations using that data, the program sort of um, was reborn. I think it, it does, however, take more than just the leader. You have to have a team who's really engaged in working with departments and helping to spread that message from the ground up as well. Uh, and then I, the last thing I think I'll say is that um, you know, in an ideal world where you had great data and you could just, you know, you could easily pull the data, easily see trends, and easily identify where there were issues, um, somewhat like what happens in the private sector, then, you know, perhaps it, the leadership is not as critical and, and it, the data itself is evidence for how it can be used. But I think for most of, or at least what we've seen in most of the other cities I've talked about, in government that's not the case. You've got to make the use of the data that you have you have to actively engage with the data and, and really um, you know, work to understand how you can use it to, to manage your performance. And in that situation, I think that the leadership does play a critical role. And, and Oliver, you know, I'd, I'd love to get your opinion also on you know, sort of what came first, because I know that the mayor you know, was so focused on Blightstat, used Blightstat as sort of a springboard, but now you're sort of proliferating the practice across a lot of different areas in your work portfolio. And so I'd love to just learn a little bit more from you around what you think about leadership and how um, it's structured in New Orleans. Yeah, I, I think leadership is absolutely critical. It's, uh, it's the prerequisite to any of this happening. But I think it's also incumbent upon the administrators of a performance management system, and I take it that's probably who's listening in today, to understand that there are non-trivial downsides to performance management for political leadership, for the departments you're working with, and to be cognizant of that and making sure that you're always addressing that. Because what performance management could be, you're, you're, you're opening up what could be a lot of dirty laundry. And um, you have to make sure that the various constituents that you're working with 
that the benefits of this enterprise is out is going to outweigh the the costs that come up because we created plenty of negative stories in the paper that certainly no um, political advisor the mayor wants to read and the mayor himself doesn't want to read um, but you need a leader who's going to be able to see the big picture vision of this and see that at the end of the day the improvement you're going to get from having quality services from having a reputation for professionalizing the management in your organization that those big picture issues are going to outweigh the small little annoying stories or columns that come up and also to your the leaders within your departments um, there are non-trivial downsides to this effort for them they're going to have potentially damaging information release that's going to uh, that may reflect poorly on their management decisions on their competency as a as a manager and uh, they are understandably going m might be resistant to to that effort so I think you have to be able to bring them on your side show that you're not out there to slap people on risk uh, on the wrist you're there to to help departments use data to equip them to be more effective and in order uh, to help them make their case whatever it may be in terms of uh, resource decisions or policy changes to more senior leadership yeah, I think that, you know, I think one of the questions that we get a lot when we're out in the field is how do you overcome that resistance? Because I think that resistance, I think, I don't think there's any of us that are, you know, and I've had conversations with all of you independently that haven't, you know, faced that resistance. And I do think leadership plays a big role in thinking about uh, resistance and overcoming resistance. And I, I know that Matt wanted to jump in here because I see in the chat that he wanted to jump in. Can we test your uh, mic again, Matt? Is he still muted? Let's see. Try now, Matt. Can you unmute yourself, maybe? No? All right. So um, let's see. Let's just keep. And if, if Matt, if you want to, you can old school chat in with some. Uh, typing in some, and I'll be happy to read it in my best Matt Power impersonation, which I've been honing over the years. So if you go ahead and do that, then um, I'm so sorry that this is, this is incredibly frustrating, I know, for you and for all of us. But Chad, I think this is a good time for you to kind of come in because you have, you're now, you know, it, you know, in sort of a new era of city stat in the city that where a lot of this work started. And I think it would be great to get from your perspective you know, how has the Baltimore program been able to survive multiple mayors, been able to survive um, uh, multiple administration changes, both, um, you know, within um, mayoral runs? And also just, you know, how is it that um, you've been able to craft changes in the entire model itself to meld the management style of, um, of Mayor Rawlings Blake now? So just a little bit of background would be great for that. Sure. I think. Um... I think in the beginning, it, the leadership is really, really important and is always important for it surviving. Um, <clears throat> I think it was running for six years plus, right, before we split, before there was a mayoral uh, transition. So I think by that point, <clears throat> it was a lot easier to justify um, its existence. And I think when there was a transition, they did a really good job of saying, here's how this can help you uh, quickly transition and learn about what's going on in the agencies and drive the ship from. So I think survival was about um, being relevant and useful leading up to that so that it wasn't just we were trying to justify our own existence, we were showing that we could be value added uh, to any mayor, not just one mayor who started it. Um, I think, you know, and then, and then with that it evolves to fit the style of the leader. So when the second mayor came in, Mayor Sheila Dixon, um, that's when we started a couple of those outcome-centered meetings. So we didn't completely change the whole um, strategy for how it works, but we added a clean stack, which was focused on um, 
just making the city clean. So it wasn't just one agency, it was solid waste, housing, the control board that adjudicates citations. We got them all in there to talk about issues around making the city clean. Uh, that's also the same year we started Gunstat, where we got multiple partners in there. Uh, it wasn't just city agencies, it was multiple criminal justice partners in there to discuss uh, reducing gun violence. So, um, and, that, and that came from that mayor. Uh, with the uh, third mayor, Mayor Rollings Blake, our current mayor, she's again very supportive and bought into the program. And one of the things that we've done is add uh, outcome meetings where we also have nonprofit partners in there. So we added uh, DV stat in 2011, which is focused around reducing domestic violence. And we have our strong partner in the House of Ruth, uh, which is a nonprofit partner that helps with um, uh, services for women who are victims of domestic violence. And then we just recently added Watershed Stat, which brings in uh, nonprofit partners dedicated to cleaning up the harbor and the watershed, surrounding watershed. Um, so I think the short answer is you, we have to remain relevant. We can't just survive by, by being a hammer. We've got, you know, the team of analysts have to be strong um, and they have to know what's going on in the agencies in order to provide good information to the executive. And if you do all that, then I think it's it's easier to survive, and you then tailor you make tailor changes to the style of the executive in charge. I think that that's that that is you know, I, and we, as we saw when we were doing this in Maryland, and um, uh, Matt, one last time, are you there? No, Matt. <laughs> I hear something, but not Matt's voice. All right, we're gonna we'll have to have another conversation with both Matt and Daniel. Um, but to push the conversation along, I would like to talk a little bit about outcomes, and I think that you alluded Chad to this a little bit um, in sort of the, how you sort of reshape the way that you're approaching performance management. So you're not sort of replicating those traditional silos of government, but that you're actually trying to align data resources to solving problems that may cut across agencies. And I think we're seeing that as an approach that's being taken by a lot of different data-driven government um, uh, uh, use, you know, implementers um, across uh, really the globe. But I think that one of the key things is that ROI story and thinking about the ROI story. What, what are the returns? What are some of, how are we moving the needle in you know, producing results as when it comes to water quality, producing results when it comes to the safety of our citizens. You know, what are some of those, what are some of those uh, examples or what are some of the things, and I know that, Oliver, you have some great examples um, that we saw when we were down in New Orleans around, um, around your housing stock and blight and some of the issues that you've been sort of laser focused on. So I'd love to get just a sense from everyone, sort of what are some of those big outcomes that you have been tracking and that you have really seen um, uh, this approach move the needle on in a way that's had both um, sort of that traditional ROI impact, Matt, I'm sure that you can talk if you were, if you were plugged in right now, Matt, I'm sure you would talk about some of the great savings that Maryland has had, you know, reducing over time in some of their largest uh, agencies and scaling some of the things that they were able to do in those overtime reductions across multiple agencies because of the platform. And then also, you know, their ability to do and, and really to communicate effectively what is working and also what is not working when they're measuring the success of certain implementations. So why don't we go ahead and start with Emily and get some of the, what she would consider to be some of the, the, the biggest added value from using data to sort of drive results, whether it's in, you know, um, in, your, in, in the former approach that you were taking, Emily, or even in the, it, I'm, I know that you're already realizing some of those um, some of those uh, uh, outcomes now in, in the sort of reformatted four approach. So let us, Emily, why don't we just start with you? Sure. Um, so I, I'm going to talk to some of the results that we're seeing in our current program in the Fort Atlanta approach, um, recognizing that we're still sort of in that early stage. Our initial focus um, on Fort Atlanta, where we're spending probably 80% of our time, are on um, uh, measuring metrics that relate to public facing services. So looking at what are the services that our citizens care most about. So filling potholes, repairing sidewalks, uh, making sure that uh, issues with water bills are resolved, making sure that the trash gets picked up, um, those basic services. And we're, 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 we're really focusing here because we're getting ready to launch a 311 program in Atlanta. 
And we want to make sure that when we go live with 311 that we are able to meet the commitments that we're going to be promising to our citizens. So if we say um, that we will fill a pothole within three days, we know good and well that we can do that 90% of the time. And, and so we're really trying to align our focus right there and really tracking at a very granular level um, what those services are and how we're performing. Uh, just in the four months since we started tracking this data, I'll talk specifically to our Department of Public Works. Um, by having that visibility and by making sure that the commissioner and that the all of his, his deputies and the, the managers within those offices understand why the metrics are important, understand how the metrics are being used, and understand that it's not just to be intended to be a stick, but it really is uh, measuring this data really is critical to making sure that we can meet the commitments that we, we provide to our citizens. We've seen um, increases in the 20 to 30 percent range uh, in, in their performance. Um, so really, wow. you know, putting the, so shining a flashlight on, on what the, the performance is that they're doing, making sure that they're aware of why the information is important, and then committing to getting them the resources, uh, even in a constrained budget environment, if they need the resources. So if they need another bucket truck to be able to fix street lights, working with them to, to find those resources, we've been able to, to move the needle. The other thing that I'll just quickly touch on is that in addition to the core uh, performance management component, we're using very similar strategies with our operations team and we're already seeing results there as well. So any operations project that we are taking on, at the very beginning, we're setting quantitative targets and metrics that will measure our progress. And on a monthly basis, we're tracking that data through the, um, the Fort Atlanta program, and we're actually tracking how the different elements of our initiatives are, are moving the needle. And so we can, you know, we've launched a, an e-citation pilot, which is an electronic citation pilot, uh, we've already been able to, to demonstrate results there. We're getting ready to launch a, a new false alarm program in the city, um, and we've already set, you know, we've set targets. We're, we've worked with our vendor and the contract we've put in place to make sure that that whole contract is structured on meeting the performance targets that we've hit. Um, so I think for us it's really about sort of putting the visibility um, on the data and making sure that we use that data to, to measure our performance and to hold ourselves and departments accountable. That's excellent. And I just want to remind everyone that's listening in that you can ask questions of everyone on our panel um, at, at, or, um, you know, consistent with the questions that we're talking about or if you have your own questions by um, tweeting us um, using the hashtag pound uh, govstat or tweeting us at, at Socrata and we'll be happy to take your questions. So, um, and, and we have some in the pipeline. I'm going to get to them. I'd love to get some more. So, um, Chad, why don't you talk a little bit about your, your story as well? Um, sure, in terms of outcomes and the successes. So I think, you know, in the beginning, some of the quick ones or some of the more traditional uh, successes we were seeing were the 48-hour 48 48 pothole guarantee where they mapped out the process and said, all right, we're going to get all potholes filled in 48 hours. Um, we've done the same with graffiti where basically every graffiti request is done in under three days. I think uh, as we've evolved, we've there's certain outcome, there's certain successes which have been more outcome focused. Um, so I brought up GunSat before, I think that's a big one where uh, we uh, decreased homicides and shootings, uh, annual homicide and shootings from 2007 uh, by over 30 percent. And that was also coupled with a decrease in um, uh, arrests and release without charges. So by having a strategy of focusing on uh, gu bad guys with guns and gun offenders, uh, we saw a, a significant decrease in that outcome. Uh, some non-public safety ones, we really used, we were having a problem with water bills about two years ago, really for years, but I think people just finally had enough a couple years ago, and we, we used a lot of data, a lot of drilling down and the stat meetings to significantly decrease the number of estimated bills that were going out. Um, so we haven't eliminated them, but our outcome, our goal was zero estimates. Uh, we've significantly decreased them, and the ones that we know we'll be estimating, we have a plan for uh, addressing those. And I really think the stat process, and particularly the analysts assigned to water, played a pivotal role uh, in making that happen. It wasn't just a sort of monitoring and accountability role at these meetings. He really got involved with the agency because he understood the data really well to help drive their action on that. Um, we just started the watershed one, so I can't claim to say we've improved the water quality in the harbor significantly, but that'll be 
obviously what we look at with that meeting. You know, and, and the meetings themselves will be focused on uh, you know, more tactical targets and hopefully by achieving those we'll we'll see a correlation with an improvement in water quality. So So Maryland has a Maryland has BASTAT, which we which we were familiar, right. some of us are familiar with. So are you coordinating the work of BASTAT with um, the with your water stat um, or and and trying to, you know, do some uh, I know that with GUNSTAT You've got your public safety stats from Maryland that are sort of piping into the city stat. But are you doing any work across on the water quality stat? Um, we we started looking into that. We have not. Um, we're not completely on the same page, I'd say. But I think we we're getting partners into the room uh, that are in both meetings, and I think uh, you're starting to see the benefit. We're starting to see the benefits of having um, non-city partners in there and some partners on the state level. So. Uh, short answer is no, we are not completely coordinating on it, but over time I think it's going to, uh, they're going to go more hand in hand in terms of improving the water quality. Okay. And, and Oliver, would you, like to, would you like to chime in and talk about some of the outcomes that you've realized um, through your uh, data-driven work in New Orleans? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I, I think having uh, the ability to focus on high-level issues that cuts across departments is one of the big value adds that a performance management uh, program or shop can add to an organization. Um, I've talked about the blood example before, which is certainly an example of that. Another one that, that, we, that our shop has focused a lot on is our contracting and payables process. So when uh, when, when this administration came to office, our capital recovery program from Hurricane Katrina, which is five years before we came to office, was just slow as can be. And the reason why it was so slow is because the nuts and bolts contracting and procurement and payables process was just absolutely as slow as can be. And contracts would languish in either departments or the law departments for months and months and sometimes just actually get lost, like the physical paper contract would get lost. And by focusing on these downline logistics of making sure that those types of back office processes are working like clockwork, you can have, there's a domino effect in terms of of uh, the organization's ability to deliver services efficiently and effectively. So when we started the process, it took us an average of over 66 days with, with a totally crazy distribution. We'd have crazy outliers on the far end of the bell curve to process a contract from the department through uh, various policy and financial approvals, through the law department, which takes understandably the longest time, to finally getting signed by the mayor. So it took an average of an embarrassing 66 days. And by focusing on this issue for uh, a good two years, we saw steady, steady progress. And in the last meeting, we had just gotten our average down to 31 days, and the median was about 21 or 22. So that was we've cut that time in less than by less than half and because of that we're on schedule with a very ambitious very complicated uh, capital projects program and they've been able to do that because there's now a reliable procurement and contracting process so projects can get designed quickly build quickly if there's a change order we can we can do that change order without being uh, falling into bureaucratic paralysis. Um, yeah, so there's the example. <laughs> okay, great. No, thank you. And I think that uh, bureaucratic paralysis is a is an interesting 
is it is an interesting uh, uh, assessment. One of the questions that we're actually getting from uh, Twitter is more about um, is is more about that that resistance and how do you overcome resistance? And I think that we've all had experience overcoming that resistance. Mm. Um, I see Emily sort of vigorously shaking her head. So I think that we've all had this opportunity um, to deal with it. And maybe Emily, we could start with you. Um, it, just you know, what are some of the strategies that you've employed for some of the people that are starting this work? Or are engaged in this work that are facing that sort of I call it permafrost, you know, that that sort of entrenched culture that you know of anti-change. Um, how do you how do you get data-driven government, the message of data-driven government, to penetrate into maybe some of the harder to move cultures in government? I think we faced a, a significant amount of pushback from departments. Partly because there's the resistance to change, but partly because they've seen the program not work before, and so. What's different? You know, how are you going to prove your value? You know, how are you actually going to use this data versus it being an exercise in just collecting data? I think the two most important things that we have done, um, and I think a number of you have mentioned this in, in some of the previous comments, the first is making sure that we call them portfolio managers, um, but basically the, the team members on, who are interfacing directly uh, and working day to day with the departments, making sure that they really focus first on building the relationships, starting at the ground up, and making sure that they're really taking the time to get to know their department and the operations of that department, um, getting, having those conversations about, well, what are the things that are important to you, and if, we could, if you could pick what we track, what would, what would you pick, and how does that relate to your performance, and starting the conversation there. I think the second piece is being um, very focused on uh, you know, providing consistent feedback about what the data is telling us, why the data is important, and, and how we're using it so that they understand uh, and actually see that the, the data is being used and in, in, in um, you know, we're proving ourselves as we go. Uh, but it's really about having that relationship and constant communication about, about why the data is important. Um, that being said, it's a different process for every department. And we're there with some departments. We're getting there with others. And there are a few that are, uh, we're still sort of trying to pull along if, um, if we can. Great. And we'll, we'll get back to that. I, I definitely think that that could be a, a webinar all um, on its own, is just sort of overcoming those types of barriers or the perceived barriers to doing this work um, when you're doing this. I do want to, in the interest of time, because I want to get, there are a lot of questions, I want to get to the questions, so I want to also get to the last kind of topic that we promised the listeners uh, or the participants that we would get to, which is citizen engagement. Um, citizen engagement, I think for me, was probably the stickiest place where I you know, you know, the devil is in the details when it comes to citizen engagement. And once you sort of like open Pandora's box, it can be really Pandora's box. And you have to have the infrastructure to respond to citizen engagement. You have to have the willingness to be, you know, you know, transparency is one thing, but this is, you know, really allowing citizens to get into the feedback loop is, you know, what I'm thinking about when I'm thinking about citizen engagement. So I would love to get a sense from you kind of what you're doing around citizen engagement, if you're doing things around citizen engagement, where your thinking is, and maybe some of the best practices that you've identified along the way and so um, and so maybe um, uh, Chad if you want to get started and talk sure. a little bit about that and we'll kind of open it up to others. Sure I got two quick ones the first one is we have a 311 mobile application now so um, you know we've always had 311 call being able to call in but now you uh, can snap a picture of the mobile app so that's one of our major intakes for citizen engagement uh, and then the other one that we sort of just jumped into is we are sending a very quick seven question survey to back to citizens that have called in a service request and have left their email. So very quick seven question survey. First one is was the issue resolved? Uh, and then the other ones are questions about satisfaction level overall and with the call taker. And then there's one for open-ended um, comments they provide. So we started out about a month ago we just presented that to the water, to water in Waterstat today, earlier this morning, um, and it's it's uh, I think it's a good it's a good controlled way to get productive citizen feedback that you can immediately uh, use to drive the agency progress. Like as soon as we brought it up, um, it changes the tone of the conversation because now it's not me me uh, speculating on how the citizens are reacting to what they're doing. It's Hey, look! This is the reaction directly from the citizens. You know, the stuff we've been saying isn't because we are just looking for things to pick at. We know this is um, stuff that annoys citizens when we do it this way, and you can see. And we also put up the stuff where they were really happy too, and said, "Hey, 
here's some here's some where they're where they're really satisfied with the work they're doing, and then here's where they're really dissatisfied, and it's because you know of X, Y, and Z, and how can we start hammering away at making this better? So those are my two quick ones. I, I think actually the last point that you just made is really important to the conversation we were just having, which is you know I think that you a lot of times there's this sort of classic um, perception of the work that we do in performance stat that's been maybe sensationalized in certain television programs and things like that where it is like the hammer and we are you know in the room really trying to like intimidate people into results which is prompting bad actors and, and bad outcomes and the, and the reality is is that you have to celebrate wins you have to make a connection to the work that's happening on the front line and that connection happens through feedback and feedback really is coming from our constituencies right and that's not necessarily just constituencies internal to government so I think it's a great point to talk about using citizen feedback as part of that incentive to get people engaged in the process and 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 the desire to want to um, uh, meet everyone's needs is something that I think is drives a lot of us in the work that we're doing so I think that was an excellent point thanks Chad for that um, Oliver do you have anything that you want to talk about in terms of citizen engagement um, in in the city yeah certainly um, all our all our stat programs are public and um, that can be really scary to have a management conversation with 100, 150 flies on the wall. But um, I think it's been really helpful and made our programs much more constructive. And it, we help uh, having the public there, we're able to get have a finger on the pulse of really what is most important to citizens. We're also find out issues that we may not have thought about but citizens know a lot better than actually we do. Um, so that's very helpful. And I, I think the whole process helps you build tr trust with your citizens, that you are indeed addressing these issues seriously and professionally and honestly. And having the trust of, the, of your citizens pays enormous dividends in terms of delivering higher quality services. Okay, well, I think that that, that certainly make, makes a lot of sense, and I think that, you know, ultimately our, you know, our ultimate customers are the citizens of all of the states and cities and counties that, um, that, that, that we are working for, living for, living in, and so I, I think that, that that is certainly important. I want to get to some more questions, and so there's sort of a follow-up question to um, the, uh, the question about uh, some of that pushback and like what are the strategies and I want to I want to talk about some of the things that we did in Maryland um, on Matt's behalf and I, I just promised Matt that I'm going to give him like an Oprah style one-on-one -on -one, um, and that way we can get to the bottom of what he's doing there in the state of Maryland but I do want to talk a little bit about um, I, I do want to talk a little bit about um, what we're what you know how do you overcome those challenges when you're when you and the the key to overcoming resistance, what I found, and please chime in if you think I'm wrong, was making connections to the realities of the work on the front line. So what happened was what I found the most resistance is when um, we were taking a sort of top-down approach of solving problems instead of really understanding the problem in the, in the actual practice of delivering the service or, 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 or creating the policy or whatever the issue is that we were trying to unpack with the data. And I found that when I really got to penetrate through the permafrost or through some of that pushback and got into the front line and really understood the challenges of the people who were trying to deliver those services and trying to effectuate that change. Um, and I kept when that in very tight focus when we were trying to really resolve those problems that um, it started to create in the organization a lot of um, traction and then you have to really celebrate that traction and figure out who it is your your evangelists are across your organization and bring them up through and I and I found that doing that really enabled us to really you know in some of the tougher agencies that you're going to be working with when you're doing this is finding the people who are actually doing the work celebrating the wins Celebrating their embrace of the sort of process, and then making sure that you are kept fo keep focus on making sure the data you're looking at makes sense to the people who are doing the work, that the questions that are being asked make sense and 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 are being asked and prompted by the, the the same people. So so I really I think you know that and if anyone else wants to sort of chime in there, we have a lot of questions though, so I I, I wouldn't mind also, um, uh uh you know going to the next one, which is 
when we're getting started. And we talked a little bit in the last Hangout about getting started. So I know that Mike from Burlington is asking a question. Um, Burlington, Vermont, which is a very cool city if you haven't been there. Um, and um, about how, how do you get started? Do you kind of do uh, a, a phased approach when you're getting started? Or do you try to go and just full bore, bring everyone in and, and do a, a larger sort of proliferation? And I think you know, Oliver, you talked a little bit about the phased approach that you took. Um, uh, Chad, you're really kind of coming into a very well-developed right. program. Um, but I, I'd mm -hmm. like to get from and, and, and chime in whoever wants to answer this. Really, kind of what what? How did you really um, get? How do, how would you recommend getting started if you were doing this in another city? Would you recommend that phased approach or sort of the opening the curtains and and, and doing a, a enterprise-wide approach? I, I would recommend a phased approach. Sorry, guys. Um, but I, I wouldn't think of it, if I may suggest, I wouldn't think of it in terms of which department do you want to start with. I would start with what problem do you want to address? And I think you purposely seek out a problem that cuts across departments. Because what you have to do is show the value. If you're a, if the the driver of a performance management system within your organization. You have to show that the benefits of this of this project is going to outweigh the costs, and the costs are, are real. Um, so if you can say, you know, take a problem like infrastructure or quality of life issues or environmental issues or whatever it may be, but something that involves multiple departments who may not otherwise have had an opportunity to collaborate and talk about how their services can be coordinated better to address that problem. Um, I, think that, I, I think that's really where the, a place to start. Rather than I'm going to pick one department, because you don't want to, you don't want to, you also have to be cognizant of treating people fairly and you don't want to create a situation in which one particular department head is receiving a great deal of scrutiny and other department heads are getting a free pass. But I think if you if you reframe it around solving high priority issues that are important to the citizens and your mayor, you can get around that. And so you're thinking about Taking a problem and then bringing in maybe one or two agencies to start to that are involved in the resolution of that problem, and that being the approach instead of, and, and I, you know, I see a high value in that because I do think that when we started in Maryland, I mean, we went with the agency approach, and I do think it kind of replicated the same silos. And what we realized very fast was that, you know, if I want to make kids safer, I don't, I can't just look at the Department of Juvenile Services. I need to look at the Department of Education. I need to look yeah. at the Department of Juvenile Services, Social Services, Public Safety you know, parks and recs at the city level, you know, so there's a whole bunch of things that are impacting my ability to keep kids safe. Um, and I think that you're right. But I do think that sometimes getting started is the hardest part. And so yeah. for smaller jurisdictions, it may be that you have a couple of problems that are pressing and important to your people and they are sort of self-contained in one agency. And it might make sense to go and try to figure out where the data is and get the data mobilized to help start solving problems there. I think it is going to really make a a big difference on you know geography, demographic data. There's a few things that, and and there are ways that you can sort of, from an assessment perspective, figure out you know what would be the best approach. Mm -hmm. um, anyone else have anything they want to add to that on, on on the getting started bit? If not, I've got a good question that's come in, and I'd love to get this um, both from Chad and, and and Emily on this one, which is, what methods do you use to collect data? I know Chad that when we started. Um, in Maryland and in Baltimore, I mean, we use everything from, you know, uh, I like to call it sort of the caveman approach. We were chiseling information onto rocks, but it's actually <laughs> hashtags on paper. Um, and then, uh, you know, Excel spreadsheets was the common denominator, and it still is for many governments. Yeah. Um, and, and then we've, you know, we've increased our portfolio of sophisticated data collection mechanisms since those days. But a lot of stuff is still operating in Excel. And so I'd love to get from you kind of how are you collecting data? What are you doing? And, and um, also from Emily, I think it would be great to hear from you on this one. Sure. I'll, I'll try and be quick. Um, the first one is I'll make a plug for our Open Baltimore and Socrata. We're <laughs> trying to post as many templates as we can online. 
uh, so, so you can see what we collect and how we collect it. It's all Excel, really. Um, we put it on the agency to provide us with the data. So I'm not my team's not going in and counting, you know, how many potholes were closed. That comes from them. Um, and it's all Excel, and I think the reason that that's lasted for 13 years is the flexibility it gives you to change a measure on the fly or add a new one or get rid of ones that are outdated. Um, and I think that's why it's been so useful, even though it's very low tech. Um, we are doing a project this summer to look at how where all the data comes from, and we're not going to get it all done in one week. Um, but there will still be on the ground level, uh, you know, hash marks on pieces of paper. I don't know if you'll ever get rid of that uh, for certain for certain metrics, but we're, we're exploring ways to uh, automate some of it. So we spent a significant amount of time, um, or we have over the last six months, really going in and working with departments to understand their source systems. So we are getting hands-on with the source systems and how we extract data, what data is there, how we can use that data in its raw form. But the way we track data and the, the way we report monthly is through Excel. Um, Actually, specifically, we use Google Docs. Uh, so we are, um, unfortunately, our pockets are not quite deep enough just yet to work with Socrata. Um, we're using a, a visualization tool called They don't Beam. need to be that deep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have a very cheap tool, uh, but it's, it's basically just a visualization tool that sits on top of our, uh, our uh, uh, Google Doc, and each month our portfolio managers, they pull the data, they work with departments. Some data is raw, some data is already calculated. They get it into the final format, and then they use the, the visualization tool to create dashboards um, and to, to look at the data. We're also working with our IT department to think about, in the long term, can we build a data warehouse where we don't have to know the, the uh, back-end systems quite as well and, and get into the nuts and bolts, but that we can extract the data from that, um, that, from that core data set, get it into the data warehouse, and then have a platform on top of that. So that's, that's an 18 to month to two year project. Great. So... Uh, I, I want to apologize for all the technical difficulties. I owe everyone who's tuning in a conversation with Daniel and a conversation with Matt, which I promised to make good on. Um, I want to thank everybody for participating. I think I actually hear Matt Power like trying to chime in right now. I don't know if that's the case. Um, but Matt, if you want to give everyone a nice wave, and, and, and sorry that um, I didn't get to you. Um, we are going to post um, a recording of this uh, t on our website, and um, we'll, uh, feel free to uh, access it there. We will also be able to take questions offline, so let me know if any of our viewers have any questions um, or any ideas that they'd like to see some content sort of parsed out with this group and maybe in a future hangout. Um, but I really just want to thank everyone for um, participating. Um, Emily, Chad, um, Oliver, Matt, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. Um, Remember that you can always follow us at Socrata. Um, I'm at B.I. Blower, um, and I'll be sure to send links um, and post them with um, um, the content of today's work. So thank you, thank you, thank you, and I look forward to seeing you um, in, in a, a few weeks again for our next Hangout. Um, so have a good one, and a, a happy summer. Thanks, Beth. Thanks, Beth. Thank you. Thanks, Beth.